I have walked through the barren remains of Babylon in Iraq and the ancient Roman city of Antioch, the capital of Roman Syria, which now lies buried in silt deposits. I have visited the marble ruins of Leptis Magna, once one of the most important agricultural centers in the Roman Empire, and now isolated in the desolate drifts of sand southeast of Tripoli. I have climbed at dawn up the ancient temples in Tikal, while flocks of brightly colored toucans leapt through the jungle foliage below. I have stood amid the remains of the ancient Egyptian city of Luxor along the Nile, looking at the statue of the great Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II, lying broken on the ground, with Percy Shelley's poem Ozymandias running through my head. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare. The lone and level sands stretch far away. Civilizations rise, decay, and die. Time, as the ancient Greeks argued for individuals and for states, is cyclical. As societies become more complex, they become inevitably more precarious. They become increasingly vulnerable, burdened by vast bureaucracies, an increasingly rapacious and disconnected elite, and a blind loyalty to ideological systems and ideas that no longer correspond to reality. And as they begin to break down, there is a strange retreat by a frightened and confused population from reality, an inability to confront the fragility and impending collapse. The elites who speak in phrases and jargon that do not correspond to the real retreat into isolated compounds, whether at the court of Versailles, the Forbidden City, or our own enclaves of wealth and privilege. The elites indulge within these enclaves in unchecked hedonism, the accumulation of vaster wealth and extravagant consumption. They shut themselves off from the suffering of the masses who are repressed to extract wealth upwards with greater and greater ferocity. Resources are ruthlessly and thoughtlessly depleted until they are exhausted or destroyed. And then the hollowed out edifice which appeared unassailable and solid, collapses. The Roman and Sumerian empires fell this way. The Mayan elites, after cutting down their forests and polluting their streams with silt and acids, retreated like all dead empires back into primitivism. As food and water shortages expand across the globe, as mounting poverty and misery including rising food costs, trigger street protests in the Middle East, Africa, and Europe. Our elites are doing what all elites do. They launch more wars. They build grander monuments to themselves. They plunge their nations deeper into debt. And they take it out on the backs of the workers and the poor. The collapse of our global economy, which wiped out a staggering $40 trillion in wealth, was only the first jolt. Our elites, after destroying and dismantling our manufacturing base, sold massive quantities of fraudulent mortgage-backed securities to pension funds, small investors, banks, universities, state and foreign governments, and shareholders. And when the speculative game imploded, they looted the treasury. Crying out that the nation had a deficit crisis, 
And of course it does not. It has a revenue crisis and began dismantling basic social services, making war on the last vestiges of our unions, slashing jobs, freezing wages, throwing some six million Americans out of their homes, and standing, standing idly by as we created a permanent underclass of unemployed and underemployed, which now sees one in six American workers without jobs. The Mayan elite became, at the end, the anthropologist Robert Wright notes in A Short History of Progress, extremists or ultra-conservatives squeezing the last drops of profit from nature and humanity. This is how all civilizations, including our own, ossify and die. The signs of imminent death. Maybe to those who can break free from our electronic hallucinations, undeniable. Common sense may cry out for a radical new response, but the race towards self-emulation only accelerates because of our intellectual and moral paralysis. As Sigmund Freud grasped and beyond the pleasure principle and civilization and its discontents, human societies are as intoxicated and blinded by their own headlong rush toward death and destruction as they are by the search for erotic fulfillment. We live now in a nation where doctors destroy health, lawyers destroy justice, universities destroy knowledge, government destroys freedom, the press destroys information, religion destroys morals, and our banks destroy the economy. The turmoil in the Middle East, the implosion of national economies such as those of Ireland and Greece, the collapse of states such as Somalia and Ivory Coast, the increasing anger of a beleaguered working class at home and abroad, the growing desperate human migrations, and the refusal to halt our relentless destruction of the ecosystem on which human life depends are the harbingers of our own collapse. They are the consequences of the idiocy of our elite and the folly of globalization. Protests and movements that are not built around a complete reconfiguration of American society, including a rapid dismantling of empire and the corporate state, can at best only forestall the inevitable. We will be saved only with the birth of a new and militant radicalism one that defies all formal power structures, including the Democratic Party. Which seeks to dethrone our corporate elite from power, not negotiate for better terms. Human societies seem cursed to repeat these cycles of exploitation and collapse. The greater the extent of the deterioration, the less these societies are able to comprehend what is happening to them. And the earth is littered with the physical remains of human folly, ignorance, and hubris. There is a dark intoxication with extinction. Although this moment appears to be the denouement of the whole sad show of settled, civilized life, that began some 5,000 years ago. For there is nothing left this time on the planet to seize. And we are now spending down the last remnants of our natural capital, including our forests, fossil fuel, air, and water. This time, when we go down, it will be global. There will be no new lands to pillage, no new peoples to conquer and exploit. Technology which has obliterated the constraints of time and space has turned our global village into a global death trap. The fate of Easter Island will be writ large across the broad expanse of planet Earth. 
the failure of the liberal class whose role in society is designed to prevent unchecked assault by centralized power, is discovering what happens when you tolerate the intolerant. Let hate speech pollute your airwaves. Let corporations bry up your courts and state and federal legislative bodies. Let the Christian religion be manipulated by charlatans to demonize Muslims, gays, intellectuals, discredit science, sanctify unfettered capitalism, and become a source of personal enrichment. Let unions wither under corporate assault. Let social services and public education be gutted and stripped of funding. Let Wall Street carry out fraud, deception, and plunder with impunity, and you roll out the welcome mat for fascism. The liberal class and much of the left has busied itself with the toothless pursuits of inclusiveness, multiculturalism, identity politics, and tolerance, a word Martin Luther King never used, and forgot about the primacy of justice. It naively sought to placate ideological and corporate forces bent on the destruction of the democratic state as well as the planet. The liberal class, like the misguided Democrats in the former Yugoslavia or the hapless aristocrats in the Weimar Republic, invited the wolf into the hen house. It forgot that, as Karl Popper wrote in The Open Society and its enemies, if we extend unlimited tolerance even to those who are intolerant, if we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant, then the tolerant will be destroyed and tolerance with them. Financial regulation, largely put in place by the New Deal, not only protected us from the worst excesses of capitalism, but were the bulwarks that made democratic participation possible. Workers in this country fought long and hard for their rights. They suffered brutal beatings, mass expulsions from company housing and jobs, endured crippling strikes, targeted assassinations of union leaders, and armed battles with hired gun thugs and state militias. The Rockefellers, the Mellons, the Carnegies, and the Morgans the Koch brothers, industries, Goldman Sachs, and Walmart of their day never gave a damn about workers. All they cared about was profit. The eight-hour workday, the minimum wage, social security, pensions, job safety, paid vacations, retirement benefits, and health insurance were achieved because hundreds of thousands of workers physically fought a system of capitalist exploitation. They rallied around radicals such as Mother Jones, United Mine Workers President John L. Lewis, and Big Bill Haywood and his Wobblies, as well as the socialist presidential candidate Eugene V. Debs. They had no illusion that the bosses were their friends, much less celebrities to be admired and emulated. It is they who made possible our middle class and opened up our democracy. The elite fought back viciously. Federal marshals, marshals state militias, sheriff's deputies, and at times army troops, along with the courts and legislative bodies, were used to crush and stymie worker revolts. Striking sugarcane workers were gunned down in Louisiana in 1887. Steel workers were shot to death in 1892 in Homestead, Pennsylvania. Railroad workers in the Pullman strike of 1894 were murdered. Coal miners at Ludlow, Colorado in 1914 and at Matewan, West Virginia in 1920 were massacred. Our freedoms and rights were paid paid for with the blood of ordinary men and women. American democracy arose because those 
consciously locked out of the system, put their bodies on the line and demanded justice. The exclusion of the poor and the working class from the systems of power in this country was, after all, deliberate. The Founding Fathers deeply feared popular democracy and they rigged the system to protect the elite from the start, something that has been largely whitewashed in public schools and by corporate media that has effectively substituted myth for history. Europe's poor fleeing to America from squalid slums and workhouses in the 17th and 18th centuries were viewed by the elite as commodities to exploit slaves, Native Americans, indentured servants, women, and men without property were not represented at the constitutional conventions. In American history, as Howard Zinn pointed out in the People's History of the United States, has been one long fight by the marginalized and the disenfranchised for dignity and freedom. Those who fought this battle understood the innate cruelty of capitalism. When you sell your product, you retain your person, said a tract published in the 1880s during the Lowell, Massachusetts mill strikes. But when you sell your labor, you sell yourself, losing the rights of free men and becoming vassals of mammoth establishments of a moneyed aristocracy that threatens annihilation to anyone who questions their right to enslave and oppress. Those who work in the mills ought to own them, not have the status of machines ruled by private despots who are entrenching monarchic principles on democratic soil as they drive downwards freedom and rights, civilization, health, morals, and intellectuality in the new commercial feudalism. As Noam Chomsky points out, the sentiment expressed by the Lowell Mill workers predated Marxism. It points to a time in American history 150 years ago when working for wages was a form of chattel slavery. The slogan of the Republican Party, the banner under which northern workers went to fight in the Civil War was, we're against chattel slavery and wage slavery, free people did not rent themselves to others. Freedom means not taking orders from others. It took a long time, Chomsky points out, to drive into people's heads the idea that it is legitimate to rent yourself. And once that was accomplished, we began to internalize oppression. We chatter about something called the American dream. And now that the oligarchic elite have regained control of all of the levers of power, that dream is being exposed as a cruel hoax, and we are being shoved back into the cage. Slick public relations campaigns, the collapse of public education, nearly a third of the country is illiterate or semi-literate, the rise of amoral politicians, such as Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, who pose as liberals, who pose as liberals while selling their souls and betraying basic liberal and democratic principles for corporate money, have left us largely defenseless. The last vestiges of unionized workers in the public sector are reduced to protesting in states like Wisconsin for collective bargaining, in short, the right to ask employers for fair working conditions. This shows how far labor and the country has deteriorated, and it looks as though even this basic right to ask, as well as raise money through union dues, has at least for the moment been successfully revoked in Madison. The Democratic Party and the remnants of organized labor steered passions in Wisconsin away from a general strike where workers should have gone to tepid attempts to recall legislators. The public debate, meanwhile, dominated by corporate 
controls systems of information, ignores the steady impoverishment of the working class, and absence of legal and regulatory mechanisms to prevent our reconfiguration into a neo-feudal society. The airwaves are saturated with good-looking and charming corporate apologists. They ask us why public sector employees have benefits sneeringly called entitlements, while non-unionized working and middle-class people are denied. And the argument is ingenious. It pits desperate worker against desperate worker in a mad scramble for scraps. It is, of course, the wrong question. Why, we should ask, don't working men and women have health insurance, pension plans, job protection, and living wages? And until we again speak in the language of open class warfare, grasping, as those who went before us did, that the elite will always promote itself at our expense, we are doomed to a 21st serfdom. The pillars of the liberal establishment, which once made incremental and piecemeal reform possible, no longer function. The liberal church, for example, forgot that Christian heretics exist. It forgot that the scum of society, look at the new Newt Gingrich, always wrap themselves in the flag and clutch the Christian cross to promote programs that mock the core teachings of Jesus Christ. And for all their years of seminary training and Bible study, these liberal clergy have stood by mutely as tele-evangelists betrayed and exploited the gospel to promote bigotry, hatred, and greed. What was the point, I wonder, of ordination? Did they think the radical message of the gospel was something they would never have to fight for? Schools and universities on their knees for corporate dollars and their boards dominated by hedge fund managers and investment bankers have deformed ed education into the acquisition of narrow vocational skills that serve specialized corporate interests. Our public schools create classes of drone-like systems managers. They make little attempt to equip, equip students to make moral choices stand up for civic virtues, to seek a like of meaning, and to actually think. The moral and ethical issues that should define education are no longer asked. Humanities departments, whose liberal arts curriculum once challenged structures and assumptions, are vanishing as swiftly as the ocean's fish stocks. The electronic and much of the print press has become a shameless mouthpiece for the powerful, a vehicle for spectacle and a magnet for corporate advertising. As anyone watching the live coverage of the royal wedding sponsored by J.P. Morgan Chase <laughs> grasped. It does not give a platform to the poor, to working men and women, but diverts us with celebrity meltdowns, lavish lifestyle programs, reality, television, and gossip. Artists who once had something to say have retreated into elite enclaves, preoccupied themselves with abstract, self-referential junk and the frivolous. Advertising agencies and publicists flood the airwaves with lies on behalf of corporate sponsors. And the Democratic Party, most egregiously, sold out working men and women for corporate money. It permitted, under Clinton and Obama, the state apparatus to be surrendered to corporate interests. And there is no liberal institution left. The press, labor, culture, public education, the church, or the Democratic Party that makes any effort to hold back the corporate juggernaut. 
And the longer we are tricked into investing our faith in the power system, the more easily we will be exploited. We have been taught to tolerate the intolerant from propaganda outlets such as Fox News to Christian fascists to lunatics and bigots in the Republican Party to a criminal class on Wall Street and in corporations. And we are paying the price. The only place left for us is on the street. Thank you. We must occupy state and federal offices. We must foment general strikes. We must be willing to accept the discomfort of arrest and jail. The elite, with no check left on their greed and criminality, are gorging on money while they are slashing basic services, budgets for schools, firefighters, and assistance programs for children and the elderly. So we will pay for the fraud they committed when they wiped out $14 trillion of housing, wealth, wages, and retirement savings. We now live in Orwell's Oceana, not Huxley's The World State, Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. Play the role assumed by Emanuel Goldstein in Orwell's novel, 1984. Goldstein in the novel is the public personification of evil. His machinations and clandestine acts of violence dominate the nightly news and national discourse. Goldstein's image appears each day on Oceana's television screens as part of the country's two minutes of hate daily ritual. And without surrendering, surrendering all power and civil liberties to the state, Goldstein, like the Islamic terrorists, we are told, will kill you. All excesses are justified in the titanic fight against evil personified. And the inculcation of fear, the pernicious ideology of permanent war, has left us clamoring for our own enslavement. Like the residents of Oceana, we forgot that terrorism is a tactic, one that has been with us since Solist wrote about it in the Jukarthan Wars. And you cannot make war against a tactic. Terrorists are defeated by isolating them within their own societies. And after 9-11, we had garnered the empathy of not only the world, but the Muslim world, where I was reporting at the time for the New York Times. Muslims were appalled at what had been carried out in the name of their religion. Sheikh Tan Tawi, the chief Islamic authority in the Sunni Muslim world, denounced the attacks of 9-11 as a crime against humanity, which they were, and Osama bin Laden as a fraud, someone who had no religious training or authority to issue religious edicts or fatwas. And if we had had the courage to be vulnerable, to build on this empathy, rather than dropping iron fragmentation bombs all over the Middle East, we would be far safer and more secure today. But we drank deep from the very dark elixir of nationalism, that toxic brew of self-exaltation and racism, that elevation of ourselves and denigration of others, and at that moment embraced the evil we set out to fight. We widened our occupation of Muslim land 
across the Middle East, unleashed proxy wars in Yemen and Pakistan, turned our backs on the brutal assaults by Israel against the Palestinians and Lebanese, and chose to speak to the Muslim world exclusively in the language of violence. Where else but from us did the 9-11 hijackers learn that huge explosions and death above a city skyline are a peculiar form of communication. It was straight out of Hollywood. And this is the way we have spoken to the rest of the world for decades. When Robert McNamara in 1965 began the saturation bombing of North Vietnam, a bombing that would leave hundreds of thousands of civilians dead, he said it was designed to send a message to Hanoi. Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda learned to speak the language we taught them. And the death spiral of violence that we have embraced is one where, as Nietzsche understood, we are doomed to pit our monsters against their monsters. Terrorism against us will not end until the state terrorism we practice on Muslim land ends. We began this cycle of hate and only we can end it. The torture of Private Bradley Manning mirrors the torture of the dissident Winston Smith at the end of 1984. Manning, held as a maximum custody detainee, spends 23 hours of every 24 hours alone. He is denied exercise. He cannot have a pillow or sheets for his bed. Army doctors have been plying him with antidepressants. The cruder forms of torture practiced by the Gestapo have been refined by our Orwellian techniques, many developed by government psychologists to psychologically destroy human beings. We break souls as well as bodies. It is more effective. And by breaking dissidents like Manning, who expose the war crimes we are committing in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, it sends a message to all who contemplate defying state power. We can all end up in Orwell's dreaded Room 101. We can all be made compliant and harmless. These special administrative measures are now routinely imposed on dissidents, including Syed Fahad Hashmi, who was imprisoned under these conditions for three years before ever going to trial. Thousands of detainees in our black sites across the globe experience these forms of scientific torture daily, as do those in our maximum security prisons where the state makes war on our most politically astute underclass, African Americans. We once had Huxley's world state with its easy credit, consumerism, and mass-produced junk. But that was only a temporary diversion as we were cleverly stripped of personal and political power. Now that the credit has dried up, the mass-produced goods are no longer cheap. And our ability to make a decent standard of living has gone. We get Orwell's naked iron fist. The noose is tightening. The era of amusement is being replaced by the era of repression. 
Tens of millions of citizens have their emails, phone records, all communication turned over to the government. We are the most monitored and spied on citizenry in human history. Our daily routines are caught on dozens of security cameras. Our proclivities and habits are recorded on the internet. Our profiles are electronically generated. Our bodies are patted down at airports and filmed by scanners. And public service announcements, car inspection stickers, and public transportation posters constantly urge us to report suspicious activity. Public space has been privatized by corporations who use security systems to prevent public expressions of discontent and remind us that we are nothing more than their consumers. The enemy, we are told, is everywhere. Those who do not comply with the security dictates of the war on terror, a war which, as Orwell noted, is endless, are silenced. The draconian security measures used to cripple protests at the G20 gatherings in Pittsburgh and Toronto were wildly disproportionate for the level of street activity. But they sent, like the torture of Manning, a clear message. Do not try this. The FBI's targeting of anti-war and Palestinian activists, which saw agents raid homes in Minneapolis and Chicago is a harbinger of what is to come for all who dare to defy the state's official newspeak. The agents are thought police, seized phones, computers, documents, and personal belongings. Subpoenas to appear before a grand jury have been served now on 26 people. And these subpoenas cite federal law prohibiting, quote, providing material support or resources, resources to designated foreign terrorist organizations. Terror, even for those who have nothing to do with terror, becomes the blunt instrument used by Big Brother to protect us from ourselves. Do you begin to see then what kind of world we are creating Orwell wrote, it is the exact opposite of the stupid, hedonistic utopias that the old reformers imagined, a world of fear and treachery and torment, a world of trampling and being trampled upon, a world which will grow not less but more merciless as it refines itself. Acts of resistance in the face of evil are moral acts. They are carried out because people of conscience can no longer tolerate abuse and despotism. They are carried out not because they are effective or even practical in a utilitarian sense, but because they are right. Those who begin these acts are few in number, they are dismissed by the cynics who hide their fear behind their worldliness. Resistance at its core is about affirming life in a world dominated by corporate systems of death and resistance is the supreme act of faith, the highest form of spirituality. It is time for us to choose whose side we are on, who we will stand with as our civilization unravels, the hungry and the suffering, who already comprise half of our globe, are becoming as familiar to us as our own underclass, and it is time to accept that to live in the fullest sense of the word, to exist as a free and independent human being, means open rebellion 
and a constant defiance of all centers of established party power, including the Democratic Party. <laughs> Cast your whole vote, not a strip of paper merely, but your whole influence, Thoreau wrote in Civil Disobedience, after going to jail for refusing to pay his taxes during the Mexican-American War. A minority is powerless when it conforms to the majority. It is not even a minority then, but is irresistible when it clogs by its whole weight. Those who recognize the injustice of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, who concede that these wars are not only a violation of international law, but under post-Nuremberg laws defined as criminal wars of aggression, yet continue to support politicians including Barack Obama, who fund and advance these wars, have forfeited their rights as citizens. By allowing the status quo to go unchallenged, from Wall Street to Baghdad, they become agents of injustice. To do nothing is to do something. And those who profess a love of democracy and justice, but who continue to cooperate with these established power structures, practice a false morality. They vent against war in the corporate state, but do not actually resist. They take refuge in the conception of themselves as practical men and women, as realists, as moderates. They stand on what they insist is the middle ground without realizing that the middle ground has shifted under us and the old paradigm of left and right, liberal and conservative, is meaningless in a world where to quote Immanuel Kant, all of our structures of power have embraced a radical evil. This timidity, this failure to act, is the worst form of moral cowardice. It cripples and destroys us. When Dante enters the city of woes in the inferno, he hears the cries of those whose lives earned neither honor nor bad fame, those rejected by heaven and hell, those who dedicated their lives solely to the pursuit of happiness. And these are all the good people, the ones who never made a fuss, who fill their lives with vain and often empty pursuits, harmless, no doubt, to amuse themselves, who never took a stand for anything, never risked anything, who went along they never looked too hard at their lives, never felt the need to look, never wanted to look. As long as we remain paralyzed by fear, and fear of the other is the only thing Obama and the Democratic Party intends now to offer us, we will continue to be disempowered and impoverished. To resist while there is still time has become a moral imperative. It must be carried out, not because it will or won't work. I'm not naive enough to promise you that it will. But because it is right, we cannot use the word hope if we do not actively resist, if we are not willing to make hope visible. Courage, as Aristotle wrote, is the highest of human virtues because without it, we are unlikely to practice any other virtue. And once we find this courage, we find freedom. Camus argued that we are separated from each other. Our lives, he wrote, are meaningless. We cannot finally influence fate. We will all die. Our individual being will be obliterated. And yet, Camus write, wrote, one of the only coherent philosophical positions is revolt. It is a constant confrontation between man and his obscurity. It is not an aspiration, for it is devoid of hope. That revolt is the certainty of a crushing fate without the resignation that ought to accompany it. A living man can be enslaved and reduced to the historic condition of an object Camus warned, but if he dies in refusing to be enslaved, 
he reaffirms the existence of another kind of human nature which refuses to be classified as an object. The rebel for Camus always stands with the oppressed, the unemployed, the sick, the homeless, the one of four children in this country who depend on food stamps to eat, the Palestinians in Gaza, the frightened families in Iraq and Afghanistan, the disappeared who are held in our global black sites, the legions of poor in our inner cities and depressed rural communities, undocumented workers, those in our prison system. To stand with them does not permit us to collaborate with institutions such as the Democrats, who mouth the words of justice while carrying out acts of oppression. It means open and direct defiance and often very lonely acts of revolt. The power structure and its liberal apologists dismiss the rebel as counterproductive. They condemn the rebel for refusing to compromise on justice. The elites and their apologists call for calm and patience. They use the hypocritical language of tolerance, compromise, generosity, and compassion to argue that the only alternative is to work and accept systems of power that long ago abandoned these virtues. The rebel, however, is beholden to a moral commitment that makes it impossible to stand with the power elite. The rebel refuses to be bought off with foundation grants, invitations to the White House, television appearances, book contracts, academic appointments, or empty rhetoric. The rebel is not concerned with self-promotion or a career or public opinion. The rebel knows that, as Augustine wrote, hope has two beautiful daughters, anger and courage, anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain the way they are. The rebel is aware that virtue in the wider society is not rewarded. The act of rebellion defines itself. And in these acts of rebellion, especially when they are carried out against monolithic forces of power, we see human majesty. You do not become a dissident just because you decide one day to take up this most unusual career, Václav Havel said when he battled the communist regime in Czechoslovakia. You are thrown into it by your personal sense of responsibility, combined with a cl complex set of external circumstances. You are cast out of the existing structures and placed in a position of conflict with them. It begins as an attempt to do your work well and ends with being branded an enemy of the state. The dissident does not operate in the realm of genuine power at all. He is not seeking power. He has no desire for office and does not gather votes. He does not attempt to charm the public. He offers nothing and promises nothing. He can offer, if anything, only his own skin. And he offers it solely because he has no other way of affirming the truth he stands for. His actions simply articulate his dignity as a citizen, regardless of the cost. The capacity to exercise moral autonomy, the capacity to refuse to cooperate, offers us the only route left to personal freedom and a life with meaning. Rebellion is its own justification, and those of us who come out of the religious left have no quarrel with Camus. Camus is right about the absurdity of existence right about finding worth in acts of rebellion rather than some bizarre dream of an afterlife 
or Sunday school fantasy that God rewards the just and the good. O oh, my soul, the ancient Greek poet Pindar wrote, do not aspire to immortal life, but exhaust the limits of the possible. We differ with Camus only in that we have faith that rebellion is not ultimately meaningless. Rebellion allows us to be free and independent human beings, but rebellion also, I believe, chips away, however imperceptibly, at the edifice of the oppressor and sustains the dim flames of hope, empathy, justice, and love. And in moments of profound human despair, these flames are never insignificant. They keep alive the capacity to be human. We must become, as Camus said, so absolutely free that existence is an act of rebellion. And those who do not rebel in our age of totalitarian capitalism, those who convince themselves that there is no alternative to collaboration, commit spiritual and moral suicide. Alexander Herzen speaking a century ago to a group of anarchists about how to overthrow the Tsar reminded his listeners that it was not their job to save a dying system, but to replace it. We think we are the doctors, he said. We are the disease. All resistance must recognize that the body politic and global capitalism are dying, and we should stop wasting energy trying to reform or appeal to it. This does not mean the end of resistance, but it does mean very different forms of resistance. It means turning our energies towards building sustainable communities to weather the coming crisis, since we will be unable to survive and resist without a cooperative effort. It means acceptance that this struggle for justice will outlive us, that every value we fight for may, may, may be diminished when our own lives draw to a close, but external reality cannot be the yardstick for how we measure the moral life. Our mediocre and bankrupt elite is desperately trying to save a system that cannot be saved, and more importantly, they are trying to save themselves. All attempts to work within this decayed system and this class of power brokers will prove useless, and resistance must respond to the harsh new reality of a global capitalist order that will cling to power through ever-mounting forms of brutal and overt repression once credit dries up for the average citizen, once massive joblessness creates a permanent and enraged underclass, and the cheap manufactured goods that are the opiates of our commodity culture vanish. We will evolve, I expect, into a system that more closely resembles classical totalitarianism. Cruder, more violent forms of oppression will have to be employed as the softer mechanisms of control favored by what the philosopher Sheldon Wolin calls our system of inverted totalitarianism breakdown. We cannot allow ourselves to surrender to the dehumanizing ideology of totalitarian capitalism. Acts of resistance which keep alive another narrative empower others who we may never meet to stand up and carry the flame we pass to them. And I know of what I speak. It was my father's life of defiance, his fight as a Presbyterian minister for racial equality, against war, and finally his outspoken defense of gay rights, positions that sabotaged his own career and drove him out of pulpit after pulpit that set every single standard by which I measure my own life. It is my voice tonight that you hear. 
but these are his words. And in the Christian faith, we call this resurrection. Thank you.